I'm Jeremy Smith. I, uh, I'm the general manager for Charlie's Produce here in uh, Oregon, which is right off of uh, Jennifer Street and Clackamas. We recently moved from over in the Gresham area. But uh, we're a wholesale distributor. We supply both restaurants and retailers. Uh, we're the largest wholesale in the Northwest, so we've got a lot of opportunity to get fruit to market. We're looking constantly for more Oregon products to get out to our customers. And uh, I guess the simple, and it certainly isn't intended to be offensive, but could be. Um, we're always looking for it now, and that's unfortunately the case of our business. Our customers want it yesterday, so uh, we're just looking for more quicker. So I don't know uh, exactly how we can help any of you guys get there, but that's our interest. We've got um, a severe demand exceeds supply situation. So we're constantly looking for strawberries. Just as a, a short example, last week we could have sold probably 1,200 cases in the middle of the winter at a FOB of over 25 bucks, and we couldn't even get them. So, you know, it's a uh, situation where it doesn't matter if it's, you know, in the middle of the spring, summer, winter, fall, strawberries continue to, to go up in demand, and all of our customers continue to expect them 365 days a year. So we know that that's difficult and it's not easy for any of you guys to do, but uh, I think it, it starts with figuring out how to get the, uh, the right variety that's going to be successful for all of us. And obviously it may be multiple varieties. So I hope to uh, help in any way I can. I'm Matt Newman, I'm the Retail Sales Manager of Charlie's Produce in Portland. I uh, echo what Jeremy said, again, we've been asked by our retail partners to find a berry that we can supply their stores that holds up for more than 20 minutes on a shelf. And so uh, we're kind of the middle guy here, but we are a vehicle that can distribute product from your farm to the store that we go to. And we service the entire state of Oregon and Washington. I'm Gene Burstay. I'm a produce buyer merchandiser for Market Choice. We're a Eugene-based company, uh, family-owned. We have uh, nine stores in Oregon, and uh, can you speak up a little, please? Just grab the yeah. microphone there. Every year, we get more and more demand for Oregon strawberries, and the, the few growers, especially down in the southern Willamette Valley where we're at, um, they sell almost everything they grow at their fruit stands, and there's you know we just basically get what's left over. We get their overflow fruit. And so when we do have it in the stores, it's snatched up within a couple of hours. We sell out so quickly. And, uh, you know, the demand, like the, these guys are saying, the demand is there. And uh, we're just basically saying we can't get any more than what we got. And if there's any way we can help you guys, uh, you know, figure out how to get more into the market, that's what we want to do. <coughs> I can sell the local strawberries two to one over the California strawberries when I have them. They'll, they'll pay double for the local strawberries what they pay for the California strawberries. I'll, I'll put them side by side and the local ones will be gone first every time. I'm Chris Harris. I'm the uh, produce merchandiser and local produce buyer for New Seasons Market and we're a chain of uh, grocery stores uh, in the Portland area. Uh, our first store in 2000 in the Raleigh Hills neighborhood and just opened our 15th store uh, last week in the Grand Park neighborhood. Um, and one of the speakers earlier said it for, for us, I mean, the local strawberries really kick off our entire um, local berry season. Uh, so not only do we sell a huge uh, <coughs> volume of the local strawberries when they come on, um, but it really sets the tone and gets our customers interested in local berries and it carries through um, to the whole rest of the season. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities there. Uh, for us, around local strawberries, it's become a, a huge promotional event for us that really um, distinguishes us in the marketplace our ability to, to, uh, to market fresh strawberries. And that carries on to the rest of our, our berry program. All right, um, I think we can just open it up for some questions at this point, um, whether it be, you know, what they say, and if it works for you guys or why that wouldn't, 
be able to work for you as growers, um, some of your needs that may not be being met by buyers that you've worked with in the past, things like that. I'd like to know what you pay the farmer for the strawberries. So <laughs> That's the chase. The the market. Do I need to repeat that question? <laughs> <laughs> no microphone needed. <laughs> I know what I pay. Usually, most of the berries go through a wholesaler, and you know they get to make whatever they need to to truck, you know, truck them to the stores and such. But I mean, local strawberries, they most of the, the folks can almost name their own price. I mean, I paid up to thirty dollars a flat for local strawberries and been glad to get them because um, there are just so many people that want them. And, you know, we've had a have to put them out at you know four ninety nine for a pint basket, and they're still gone just like that. I mean, that that's what that's how hot they are. I don't know all leave your cards. <laughs> <laughs> I know that for for us on the wholesale side last year, and probably even if you took both two thousand and thirteen and fourteen averaged them out, we're probably somewhere around a buck seventy five per pound. Per pound. Yep. Yeah. I raise the. Uh, Tillamook variety, and I haven't heard anybody talk about the Tillamook strawberry. Would you be open to that variety? Not at the top of our list, but um, Kroger's. What about you guys? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about anything. Okay. And I'll tell you what it comes down to is the performance of the berry is what matters. So, if the Tillamook variety that you've got performs well for us. It is something we're interested in, but what we've seen historically that that one hasn't necessarily performed well for us when we've gotten it. Why not? That's what yeah, what a lot of it depends on how they're handled. Absolutely, from, from yeah. the time they're picked until the time that they get into my hands. You know, do they sit on a back, the, you know, sit in the back of a pickup truck for four right. hours in the hot sun, or were they picked and immediately put into a cooler and, and then um, shipped cold to the store? Yep. Because if I get them in good shape. And I have one day to sell them. I can usually go through them. Yep. We don't usually buy at, at store level. We hunt with local berries. We buy one day at a time. We don't want if they're there the next day. They're usually in the garbage or in the compost. That's the same goal that we have as a distributor as well. We want it in that day, out the next, and not we'll, yeah. we're not here to sit on local strawberries. Yeah. We, for us, it's it's uh, it's only worked when it's been direct delivered to the stores and, and daily direct delivery to the stores. So that Again, it's, it's one day, one day sales, and that's it. We have not had good luck with the Teloma variety. Uh, just had not gotten a good response from our customers. Uh, of course, the variety that everybody asks for, and I need to say it, I need to say it. Um, <laughs> hood. I mean, we sell an incredible amount of goods, and that's the one, that's the one that our customers ask for by name, and the one that they get upset if we don't have hoods. And the one that they turn around and walk away from the table if we tell them it's a different variety. Um, you know, I, I, I wish that wasn't the case, but that's reality. So, um, you know, we were certainly op open to trying new varieties. Um, I would recommend you name them a new hood. <laughs> we'll sell themselves. Um, outside of good season, we've had um, really good, uh, good luck with the Albion. How big does the grower need to be before they even come near you? We don't, we don't have any size um, requirements. And we've, uh, you know, we've hooked up specific growers just with one of our stores and since supply all the stores. Uh, with that said, we do need a certain um, level of consistency. <laughs> Why is it uh, we, do, we need a certain level of consistency is the thing stores uh, need to know that they're, that they're going to have the berries. Uh, but yeah, there's no specific size requirements. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've just started up. So. Yeah, I do the same thing. I might have four different um, Marion berry growers in Eugene. Each one of them, I'll give them their own store to supply um, because there just aren't that many. You know, a lot of those folks can only produce two or three flats a day, and so we'll, we'll take them. And, uh, We'll sell everything out before dinner time usually. But like I said, with some of those things, we're so limited, we're just glad to get what we can. So 
Somebody would go to you or go to the store? Call me first and negotiate the terms um, as far as the price, how they're going to be packaged, you know, the flat, the calyx, all, all those different things. And um, we would have to also, you know, set the parameters for delivery schedules. You know, when you need to, you know, there's cutoff times. You can't show up with strawberries at 7 o'clock at night. You got to get there, you know, before the delivery hours or whatever. That kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I've learned on my stand. I gotta get up early and get in the stand. <coughs> yeah. So once, usually, once I make contact with a grower, I negotiate all the terms, and then I would just hook you up with the, the name of the produce manager and, and the phone number of the vendor, um, address of the store, and then you would just deal with them from that point forward for the rest of the season. We have a similar process. Um, the one thing is. Um, to make sure there's communication, if there are changes, and if there's going to be gaps in supply, then I need to know about, about those things as the season goes along. But otherwise, in terms of daily ordering, that would be direct to the store. And in our world, we've got hundreds of stores we're supplying, as well as restaurants. So we can, we can take small supply as long as um, it's not a one and done deal, because it does cost money to set you up as a vendor and go through our internal processes of checking off that you're meeting all of our food safety requirements because we do have a, uh, a pretty high standard but I think even small growers have been able to we've helped them get there uh, but it would have to be something and I, I think Chris started by saying something that's consistent so even if it's once a week and it's 10 flats on a Monday we know that you know we can count on that that if you had a great you know, weekend where you sold them all out at your fruit stand, and we don't end up with nothing. So it's a partnership. So, do you have any certifications you have to have? Yeah. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah, air conditioning. Try to use the microphone and repeat the questions. I think it's getting a little bit. Only certification or paperwork I need is if, if you're working on any copy of work on certification for them to keep on file. Did, she asked if there was any um, certification that we needed. And here we just pass around my yeah, because the, the fat is quite loud. Uh, so the question was whether we needed uh, any certification. Right. And what I said was uh, the only certification that we require um, is if you're an organic grower, we need a copy of your organic certification. Yeah, we, we require from the wholesale standpoint gap certification, um, a food safety plan, so we can hit or, or uh, uphold our um, SQF certification that we have as a warehouse. So barcodes, stuff that comes in, do you have to be barcoded then? No barcodes. You're saying? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, we would require um, organic certification and then uh, liability insurance. What was liability, liability insurance. insurance. Yeah. How big of a policy? How big of a policy was the question? Two million. It's the same for, for us. What type of packaging? What type of packaging was the question? Pines or clamshells? Or... Uh, we prefer uh, open pipes, you know, a, a six pack of open pipes, half flat. Some the best for us, we sell them in the pints as well as uh, we do a lot of half flat sales as well. Yeah, I like half flats too, but 90% um, mm -hmm. of the folks I buy at Barry's from put 12 pints in a flat and we <coughs> put the cardboard pints, you know, like the plastic mesh ones, they can tend to damage the food. And I would say that we from Charlie's Forest would agree with these guys that the open pint hallux help distinguish a local berry from a California clamshell variety. So we prefer open pints in the half flat or the full flat. <coughs> they also let the berries breathe better in a clamshell environment. You do have a quicker breakdown of the berry. Yeah, Go ahead. I heard, well, talking, I heard some, some of you say that you will come and pick up the flats, and others say you have to bring them to the store. Can each one of you tell me 
who, does, who recommends or who requires what? Uh, we don't have the we don't have any tracking capabilities, so we require delivery. And um, for strawberries, it would be direct to the stores. Same for my stores. We require them to be delivered to the store directly. We unfortunately have an entire fleet of trucks, so we've got the ability to pick up. We do have growers that'll bring into our warehouse if they're close, but if we're driving right past your farm. Uh, we can arrange for pickup as well. I will add, I guess I should, I'm pretty loud, so sorry. Um, one of the challenges that we do have, and you would find this with almost any wholesale operator, is that if they are uh, on a program where they're picking up, it's a very difficult thing to coordinate with smaller farms, and usually large farms it works well because that window of our truck arriving could be two to three hours of a variance and you just don't want to be sitting there waiting when you got a lot of work to do. So uh, some of the farms that are close do deliver to us today, but we also have some that drive in from uh, even Salem because it's more convenient for them. They must have other businesses that they're either delivering to or, or you know, something's happening there. They're coming into the Portland area anyway and they go ahead and deliver because it's quicker. Do you guys see the major weakness as being um, the fact that the berries aren't uh, adequately cooled, or that um, you know the varieties themselves are just an issue that you do sell that consumers want? I'll start. I'll tell you both that we've seen. So we've we. Probably since uh, we built our business in Oregon, because Charlie's began in Seattle. When we opened our facility the very first year in 2000, we started with local strawberries, and um, it's been a struggle ever since. We are using multiple growers today, and within that grower group, you could get you know berries that'll temp as high as probably the field heat, and some that are as low as 40 degrees, but. The, uh, the temperature is significant in the shelf life, so if the cooling could be done in a better way, it would certainly help the shelf life of the fruit. And the variety, the berry, uh, I absolutely agree that the variety is a big part of the problem. I think these guys, from the retail perspective, they'll see the breakdown more so than we will on our end. I mean, the product comes in and goes out, and we don't have a chance to see how long it holds for. And what the shelf life is, so right, yeah, it's. I mean, every strawberry I've ever brought in, local, it's one day, right? And you know, if they do uh, happen to be some left in, in the next morning, uh, it's usually not very pretty. But is that because the ones that are coming in, the majority of them haven't been pre cooled, or even the ones that were cooled on farm? For there's just so many varieties that are being grown. So I think if you look at the success of the ones that we've seen shelf life tests that have been much better than others, the Albion stands out. I know Seascape is successful as well, but you start getting into some of the other berries, you get a, a big variation of success because the berry breakdown could be severe. I mean, literally, we've had them arrive at noon, 1, 2 o'clock, and they're toast by 8 p.m., and we can't even ship them the next day. I think most of the berries that we receive locally too are not chilled or cooled down on the farm. They're brought into our warehouse and cooled down yeah. in our facility as well. <coughs> I mean, the hoods are just really difficult. Uh, we've had more luck with Albion's holding up uh, for a longer time. Uh, but I can't say enough about um, the post harvest handling and cooling. And you know, what's, what's worked best for us has had the berries picked, cooled, with forced air cooled and then delivered uh, first thing the next morning. That's what's worked best uh, for us for extending the shelf life. Attorney? When they're picked the day before, when do they pick it? In the evening? When they're picked the day before, when do they, uh, when do the growers typically pick them? In the morning. In the morning. Okay. So they're 24, so they're 24 hours, old, hours old by the time they, they cool them at the farm, turn around and bring them to you the next right. morning. So, so they're, they're older. They're hours. older. They're older, but they hold up a lot longer because of the, because that that field heat is taken out of them. 
very soon after yeah. leaving the field. If, even if, even if, once they arrive at my stores, even if we put them in the cooler, it's going to take hours for them to, to come down to temperature. So that it's not just it's not just putting them in the cooler; it's the forced the forced air part of it. It's critical. Well, I just want to comment on that. Um, we pick them first thing in the morning, early as we can, when it's coldest outside. So the berries are coming off the plant cold. It's better than picking afternoon or evening the day before, even though it's less time off the plant. Um, they're a lot hotter when they come off the plant. We want to pick them as cold as you can too, as well as get right into the cooler and cool. Did everybody hear what Will has just said? And I'm tiny, so I'm not, you know, representative. But what I do is I go out really early while it's still dark with my headlamp, <laughs> and it really lasts well. And there's, you know, obvious theory to that. So yeah. Yeah. Tia? yeah I'm just gonna make a comment. Um, one of the things I do packaging, but one of the things I concentrate on is um, life extension, and. I cannot stress, and I would echo what Chris and the rest of the panel have said, the most important thing in life extension of produce, and you can get into all the technologies that will extend life and all of that, is getting the field heat off as quickly as possible and maintaining that. And that will make or break whether the berry or a blueberry or anything will last. And having gone to a lot of these meetings, I see that as the, with the strawberries and the little strawberries. The biggest issue is getting uh, coolers available to the temperatures that they need to be to be able to market the strawberries correctly. I got a question. What in this strawberry commission? What percentage of local strawberry growers would would be represented? I guess not in just today's meeting, but in total of the the meeting so far this year. In terms of. Total volume. Like, is is a group of growers here, and that have been in <coughs> all of the other meetings this year? Is that fifty percent of the local strawberry growers? Ten percent? Eighty percent? I mean, I think. Well, I mean, numbers mean acres too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess either. I think that yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, even the way that the assessments are, are collected, it's being... Yeah, the assessments, there is half here. Of the, of the fresh market. Fresh market, yeah, if you want to look at assessment. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we don't believe that's what's truly out there. Right, which no, makes well, right. the question very difficult to answer from that perspective. But if we had to throw it in full... Well, backing up, the commission's funded from processed, only through processed fruit, from, uh, payment on processed fruit. So as a result, it's really hard to have a handle on how the fresh right. is out there. So it's so just a matter of fresh pays. Fresh, fresh does pay for the oh, strawberry. Yeah, they can. They, they, well, a lot of them do. Right. They're all they're supposed, they're supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. All right. fresh is supposed to be. Well, we have plenty of growers that are fresh or something like that. Yeah. This year. So within yeah. within that, um, what, what do you guys think in terms of your split of that? How much of it's going to processing? How much it is available in the fresh market? 95% process. process. No. Well, there's probably the first problem ahead of the variety and the cooling. Yeah. Well, for which us, is why which is why we're here. For us to get that fruit, yeah. Yeah, yeah which is why we're here and yeah. you know we're going through gotcha. earlier discussion right. if you saw the agenda. Yeah. So I don't know what you you get price per pound, but we'll pay more. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know my strawberries. <laughs> Back to Bob's question. There I gotta some. see him first. <laughs> Back to Bob's question is: For instance, there is a lot of telemark, uh, and it works really well for some growers, and not well for others. But it's a, it's maybe as much as fifty percent of the acres in the state. Wow. And so, is there a way to work with that? Because we know from telemark that if you pick it too early, it has no flavor. And that's probably why it doesn't work for you, rather than handling or quality. We also, I mean, pickers who do it for process, Bob, are you on a two-week rotation? No, every week. Every week, once a week? Yeah. But you're out to seven days, and some people go out further than that on a picky rotation. So to hold up that kind of quality for processing, but is there some sort of middle ground that people can work with? You know, where some of these people who would be willing to transition some of their product to the fresh market, if they could make Tillamook work for you guys? Well, is there any work being done on changing the crop? I mean, 
So, I mean, and, and we have had this question in previous, in well, the last workshop, discussing, you know, how would you as buyers be able to, uh, you know, would, would there be an option of having a, a panel testing or taste testing, you know, in your facility um, to maybe get the ball rolling with some of the varieties that are, you know, either just being released or... Absolutely. Whatever. We would love that. Yes. And the other challenge, too, which is... Sort of what I was trying to get at. We only have so much that significant acreage. If you start backing off those, I mean, how many acres of, you know, once we get past Totem Hood and Tillamook and Albion, you know, we drop way off to who's going to supply enough. I mean, how much shucksum can you provide? Um, how much? Well, I don't know. I mean, no. But it's still the how long it can hold in the store. That's what their problem is. Yeah. And we do have a variety of this, like for instance, a couple, one of the new ones, Sweet Sunrise. Mm -hmm. It would probably work for you, but there's a total of 200,000, may work for you, probably, I shouldn't say probably, it may work for you. But there's 200,000 plants available to go on the ground next year, which is, you know, significant, but not going to, this may not be enough to really test your, your systems. But, but then, Chad, we can take that 200,000 plants and at least get them tested and see if it works for you, and then I'll work on accelerating that acreage. Both from a grower end and end. from a buyer end. Yeah. Because it has to work for both groups, right? Well, what I can tell you is that Charlie's today has done so many different crop plantings with uh, different growers on all commodities that we're very familiar with making commitments. So if that's what we need to do to help get that there, we're willing to do that. It, it would obviously have to, you know, have some good detail to it. Right. But um, we want it to get there because there is a huge demand for it. Uh, the independent markets that both Gene and Chris are a part of today are flourishing. And those are opportunities for them to continue to grow. We supply um, a, a ton of different businesses that are interested in that. So uh, it's an opportunity, I think, for everybody. <laughs> I know, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done to get there, but we're here to help. But I, I mean, looking like at the Tillamook or other varieties, it's not going to come down to how it eats. Right. I mean, it's the flavor. Well, but to get it, I think the key thing is for work, working with you to understand, I mean, it's like I said, up Tillamook. I think, despite math, you can bring it to Tillamook, but whether it has enough shelf life by the time it tastes good, I don't know. But, you know, so there's that balance, but if if you're either the option is picking it too early, it's not going to taste good enough, and if it's picking processing quality and it's not going to have the shelf life, and everybody walks away after that, then you're sort of done. And so is there a way to somehow, you know, say to Bob, can you bring in something that tastes good that we could try, or that may not be a seven-day rotation, but is an eight-day rotation, excuse me, it may not be a ten-day rotation, but it's an eight-day rotation or whatever, that you might at least try. Yeah, we definitely be open to trying that. There you go, Bob. I got your work cut out. <laughs> Do a good job for me. I'll buy you. I'll buy you one afterwards. <laughs> well, did you want to say something? Yeah. Could you guys talk on uh, what difference it makes the the appearance of the berries coming into the store, like the quality control behind the harvesting, and how it affects your sales? I guess what you guys have seen coming in the store, what variation of quality. Uh, I mean, it makes a huge difference, the appearance. I mean, you're talking about flavor. Those are the two big components for us, our appearance and flavor. And, you know, what I tell people is, um, you know, what you don't put in your box is just as important as what you put in your box, right? So that, that's critical, that it's, it's good quality, especially when you're going direct to the stores, because it's, you can bring in, you know, 90% of your delivery is going to be perfect, but if you bring in one batch that has quality problems, that's what they're going to remember. It's critical that it's, that it's high quality and that it's consistent every time. And if, if, there's, a, if there's a problem, then, then don't bring it in and, and call us and tell us you're not going to have it. We'd rather have that than have poor quality berries come in because that's what people are going to remember. I agree completely. Dry berries are best. If they're wet and they're breaking down, toss them off to the side. 
you know, you teach your pickers not to not to squeeze the berries when you're picking. They gotta be gentle. Yeah. We're not really a store, but I, I again echo what these guys say. I mean, it's important for it to look good when it comes into us. So when we pass it on to our customers, we're not getting the negative feedback, which in turn is going to ripple effect back to you guys. Again, appearance is huge. Flavor is also paramount when it comes to logo berries. So flavor and, and taste and appearance are the, the keys. It's got to be perfect. <laughs> Easy enough. <laughs> is there a product you guys sell get certified? Comes through your thing? Uh, we're working towards that yep. today. Uh, not everybody that sells to us is GAP certified, but the guys that are, we're getting them up to speed. So I think we have until 2015 or 16. The, the question Does that what? mean everybody is going to have to be GAP certified at that time to go through a wholesaler? We're talking about GAP certification or? and whether growers that are already delivering are already certified or not. Either that or we'll have to have a plan for each one of them that is not yet with a timeline that gets them to that. A question about local versus organic. I mean, basically, our product is competing on those shelves with Driscoll's Organic or other organic. And we've heard a couple of different opinions on this as far as where the customer comes down on that. Is there agreement that if it's local, it's going to outsell something from California? Or is that organic label so strong that it's going to overcompete the, the local? I, I'd let the experts on the retail answer, but I think it's based on the customer. I, yeah. I think all, all stores are different. My stores are about 50-50 organic and conventional. So it's, it's not as important to my customers that it's organic. Uh, if I have local in the store, it's going to sell first before, before the organic. Uh, even even the, if price, there's a price difference, or is it very price sensitive at that point, too? It, in my stores, it's not price sensitive. It's, it's seen as something that's you know, uh, rare and, and not available for, you know, for very long. People know that the season is two or three weeks at best. And Get them while they're get them while they're hot. That's how they see it. And when we have them, even if we have the Driscoll Starberries, even a dollar cheaper for a container, we'll sell their local ones out. So our stores are um, we have primarily organic shoppers. They're really looking for organic. Um, with that said, they, um, the local strawberries will definitely outsell them, especially in in June. And those are the only ones that we'll promote at that time. We won't carry a, um, a California organic at that time. Um, as we go later throughout the season with the, the day neutral varieties, we'll carry both. Um, and it's, it's probably a 50 50 split. We've got a lot of um, shoppers who are, are, who are really interested in, in local, and we prefer that. But we've got a lot of um, you know, hardcore committed organic shoppers as well. Um, we'll go that way. Um, we've. we've struggle to find a local organic uh, supply. We, we continue to work with, um, you know, every year. Um, there's a few growers who are, who are trying and that we continue to work with, um, but we've never found anybody who's uh, been able to deliver um, the consistency and the uh, quality of the local organic area. I have a question about uh, just suppliers. Relationships you guys have had and been successful with uh, with people supplying berries to you, and you guys have maybe grown with those with those growers and, and your market for the products that have expanded. You know, uh, also help those farms and such uh, brand their products to their stores. Is that do you have some success? So the question was: Is there an example that you guys um, have had with uh, some growers that? Um, you've helped expand their brand um, over the years, um, and it's been successful in that sense. We have uh, several what we call the hometown favorite growers down in Eugene where we live, and we, uh, we, most of those relationships are direct. The farmer 
picks and delivers direct to the store. And we market their product with posters, pictures of their farms, and uh, we do that in print advertising as well and on our website. And uh, that's the ideal relationship for us is where the farmer calls us, we tell them how much we want, they go out and pick it. Within a couple hours, they're delivering it to the store, and um, the product is as fresh as it can get. And we have that relationship with probably 10 different people during the spring and summer months. We have it with uh, strawberries, we do it with local corn, and we do it with uh, apples and pears as well. Uh, I think I can say that, that um, Hunger Farms probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for New Season's Farm. <laughs> 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 I thought it was everywhere around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, think, I think that's a, um, a great story. It's our relationship with, uh, with the Hunger has been really successful for, for both of us. Um, and I think when you said partnership, that's, that's the key to it, is, um, is viewing it as a partnership and really working together. Um, so a lot of communication has to happen, both during the season as well as in the, in the off season, in terms of planning and coordinating, um, and then you know also the, the branding, both in the stores uh, and, as well as in our, our print and social media. But it's it's been uh, a relationship that has allowed both of us to, to really grow and be successful, despite um, heard of, um, hiccups, hiccups and hurdles along the way. Jason. When you're saying like partnerships are really important, what would you guys say is the best approach to making that initial partnership? Because I feel like a big hurdle is a lot of these growers don't know who to go to or when you guys are planning for the coming season because there's a little disparity between when growers are planning and when buyers are planning. So I guess. Probably the most important thing is to get a hold of the buyer, like myself or Chris, and see what they already have for for relationships with growers so that you're not coming into a, a situation where they've got a great corn grower that they've been buying from for 10 years and you're trying to sell them corn and you know they've got that relationship and that grower has earned their business and they don't want to interrupt that relationship so um, once you establish that then you think okay well maybe you can talk to the buyer and say well can I grow something else for you and that's where those really that's where really where the relationships begin. I've had several of those where I've talked to folks that wanted to grow something I already had a good supply of, and had them go, you know, grow some cantaloupes, and they did a great job. And from that period on, or that, that year on, they were my cantaloupe guy, and it worked out well. So it really starts, yeah, it really starts with knowing what what the demand is, and, and what areas are already covered. I can say one thing, like if. Uh, last year, I had 50 blueberry growers call me, and you know I had to turn 49 of them down because I had a really good one. The Oregon blueberry crop is it's way over planted, and it's going to get way worse because they're still planting hundreds of acres. And the, every year the price, well, it's held firm for the last two, but it's it's due to start dropping because they're getting hungry. So the, I guess the most important thing, yeah, is establish what what the gap is and, and figure out what you can do. And the sooner rather than later. Like start calling, you know, tomorrow rather than May one. Call us in the winter time and then you can start maybe planning what you're gonna do for the spring. And I think for us that's ideal, but not necessary because if somebody is looking for something the next season around the corner comes quick. For, for all of us. And if it's something that you're going to have to do, uh, if you're interested in partnering with us and you've got some, whether it's paperwork or, or inspections or something that we're going to require to, to add you to our, our list of, of growers and shippers, then there's sometimes is some detail work to be done on the front side of it. And so the day that your crop is being harvested, that's usually a bad time to call us for, you know, hey, do you want to buy something? Uh, because we too have those relationships that are already set up and we've gone out and told different farms, hey, we want you to plant, you know, this many acres for us or we're going to buy, you know, 12,000 cases of this product for you. So they've, they've actually uh, banked on that. They've gone out and, and, you know, done their budgets and 
taking care of their business based on what we've committed to. And we, you know, there's one success story that I think is uh, kind of a cool one over the years, and um, I'll mention that. And Matt's got one too that he's familiar with that we've done at Charlie's. That if you do have a scenario where you have enough volume and you don't want to do direct distribution to a, a group of stores because it doesn't fit your model. Um, we've gone out and worked with growers, and there's one in Oregon City that we, we met with uh, 15 years ago, and they were growing a lot of standard vegetables, and things had changed in the marketplace, and we asked them to start growing microgreens for us. And at the time, microgreens weren't really very well known, but the restaurant industry was starting to pick up on it because Portland's a foodie community. And today, they're, they're probably, I don't know, growing hundreds of pounds, and it's a lot to get hundreds of pounds of microgreens. They're sold by the ounce. And uh, it's become a staple for them. And instead of growing, you know, cucumbers, they're growing that. And it's, uh, it's been a successful relationship. And they're growing tons of other vegetables for us as well. But no different than the example Gene had mentioned about cantaloupe. We've done that and told guys uh, about an item that we know that they could grow well for the area that they're in, and it's worked out. Uh, one other one that we've got is actually a driver of ours that works for us uh, uh, full time, but he and his wife own some acreage out in Beaver Creek, and uh, he wanted to do something with it to keep, I think, a couple of his kids busy and his wife, and so they got it certified organic, and they're now growing, uh, I think it's four or five acres now, of delicata squash plants. <coughs> Uh, it was an item six years ago that was not being planted at the rate of, of our demand, and so he grew it. We buy it all from him now today, and it helps us offset that shortage in the market. So uh, it's worked out well in many cases, and I think that if that's something that you know we can work together on, that's a, that's an option. I would say contact uh, the buyer as soon as possible. Uh, another thing I would say is to be willing to start small and build. Uh, I like to tell people that we first start working with that it really takes about three years before we can really figure out uh, what works on our side and what works on your side and, and begin to really do some, some volume together. So be patient, be willing to, to take that time. Um, be honest about what you can deliver. Uh, there's nothing worse than, than over-promising and under-delivering. Um, and then um, be willing to listen to what your buyer's needs are make adjustments to try to meet those, uh, but also uh, be willing to express what your needs are and, and uh, what works really well for you, because that may work for the buyer and, and two of you may not have thought about it. So it's about that dialogue about what works for both of you and really figuring that out, taking the time to figure that out and, and being willing to start small and build over time. Do the raspberries and blackberries seem as short as strawberries? Supply for blackberry and raspberries, are they uh, in similar short supply to strawberries? Sure. In my area, I don't know if it's because we're in the south of the valley, but definitely, yeah. Local raspberries down there are unheard of. I, I see them up here for, for my stores that are up here. But, and blackberries, you know, we don't farm just the common blackberries you can go pick down by the river, they gotta be nice big blackberries. And there aren't very many of those here. I have two small growers in our area that can produce, you know, four or five flats a week. So there's definitely a market there. All right. If anyone, anyone has some last questions, I'd like to know if all of you have a website where we can go to get more information about your requirements for your growers, that kind of thing, or is it best for us to call you and talk to you one on one? For me to be called one on one, I can give you my card. Okay, and do you guys each have a business card or something that we can all get? So perhaps for this meeting, you guys can, if you have, leave a few cards, but we'll also collect information if you, all the buyers in the room, are okay with that, um, and then we'll distribute that in an upcoming bulletin. Um, and include programs too. Right, all buyers yeah. in the room. Yeah, so um, if if that, it seems to be a, a consensus that it'd be helpful to have information right at grower fingertips, which makes sense. Okay.
Yeah. There is, on our website, there is um, there's a talk to us page where you can get your information to really come direct to the, the, the buyers. Uh, but then it, it's all about the one-on-one -on -one talk. Okay. Tom? I was just wondering, I mean, I work a lot more with the processed industry than the fresh, but I, I was wondering about Food Hub and other connections for smaller growers. Are any of you, could you say something about them? Because it intrigues me. Uh, electronic uh, exchanges or places where smaller growers can get rid of their fruit if they need it. Stop. Uh, what's that? Get rid of it, Tom. Not get rid of it. It's late in the day. It's late in the day. It's not so did everybody day. hear the question? Okay, go ahead. <coughs> well, I just know from our perspective that that vehicle has not been successful. It hasn't? No. Okay. Because you just can't get what you need. People are it's, using it's it. It's too last minute. Okay. All right, Same last problem. question here. Okay, do you have variety already that you know? raspberries and blackberries that you like? I, I don't. Okay. I like a true Marion berry. Okay. We like tulamines on the raspberry side. What? Tulamine. 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 Of course I have. Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> it, again, it comes back to if it, if it looks, you know, great and eats well, it, it's a possibility. Like Tillamook strawberry? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll be looking for them. Yeah. Well, you see um, faces now, so uh, we hopefully you guys are able to stay for supper, so maybe there can even be some initial interaction um, with you guys here. Uh, if not, again, we'll be able to get your information, contact information out to uh, the rest of you here today. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.